If you follow the news over the last week, no doubt you've been exposed to some of the pictures and stories that have come out of Bucha in Ukraine. It's heartbreaking when we see how innocent people suffer, suffer in a war of conquest for the power of a tyrant. Whatever moral indignation we feel, imagine how much more it would be if we were Ukrainians. If you were Ukrainian, what would you be asking for? What would you be praying for? For deliverance? For justice? For revenge? I think that the Jews in Jesus' day could probably relate. They themselves had also been the subject of a war of conquest. They had suffered for the, the power of a tyrant as well. By the time of Jesus' ministry, they'd encountered a 90-year occupation by the Romans, who were brutal. And like the Ukrainians right now, I'm guessing, the Jews called on God to overthrow their oppressor. So when Jesus comes to Jerusalem, on Palm Sunday, it looks as if he's about to do exactly that. In Luke 19, 35 to 40, we read, So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles that they'd seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. Glorious, glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Up to this point in the story, Jesus has been playing it a bit coy with his messianic identity. He isn't coming right out and saying, Hey, I'm the Messiah. But at this point, all ambiguity is gone. Jesus is intending to say through his actions that he is the king coming to Zion. You see, people didn't normally ride into Jerusalem. They walked. Riding was something reserved for royalty. And by riding on a donkey, Jesus is calling to mind a prophecy from Israel's Old Testament in which the prophet Zechariah says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. I will remove the battle chariots from Israel and the war horses from Jerusalem. I will destroy all the weapons used in battle, and your king will bring peace to the nations. His realm will stretch from sea to sea and from the Euphrates River to the ends of the earth. When Jesus is asked to tamp down the expectations that his actions are arousing, he refuses because the people are right to welcome him as the king. But how do they go from welcoming him as the king on Sunday to crying out for his blood by Friday? It seems that when Jesus enters, the crowd assumes that Jesus' agenda is their own. and he's not welcoming, They're not welcoming him as the one whose agenda they are embracing, but they are welcoming him because they assume he will embrace their agenda. Despite Zechariah's promise that the king will bring peace, they don't want peace. They expect Jesus to go to war with the Romans. And when Jesus doesn't, they feel let down. And so they allow their frustrations to come out on Jesus. And they call out for his blood. And so we see in Jesus and in his contemporaries two competing visions of what the kingdom of God looks like. One, based in violence, seeking retribution. I'll call this the fist-shaped kingdom. The other based in love and reconciliation. I'll call this the cross-shaped kingdom. The fist-shaped kingdom. We like moral clarity. I think that's one of the reasons why superhero movies are so popular these days. The good guys are 
good and the bad guys are bad. And it, it's just simpler that way. And in our own stories, we like that same sort of clarity as well. We like to imagine that we are the good guys of our story and that the people who stand against us are the bad guys. But often there's more moral ambiguity. I think the Jews like to share our idea of moral clarity. They like to see themselves as the righteous oppressed and the Romans as the wicked oppressors. But when the people seem to imply that they desire Jesus to go to war, against their enemies on their behalf, then perhaps they demonstrate that they are a little more morally ambiguous than they would like to admit to themselves. They show that they're not interested in reconciliation. They're interested in revenge. When we embrace the fist-shaped kingdom, we expect God to be on our side. We expect him to take our enemies as his own enemies. We expect him to hold them to account for the evil things that they've done to us, even while we ask and expect him to forgive us for the evil things that we've done. But vengeance doesn't heal the wounds of this world. When we get revenge on the person who's done something wrong to us, we simply create an escalating cycle of violence and counter-violence. We see this in the Jewish nationalist movement. The same kind of people calling out for Jesus to take the battle to the Romans, well, they take the battle to the Romans themselves about 35 years after Jesus. And it doesn't bring about God's kingdom. It doesn't bring about healing. It brings about a catastrophe. A war the culmination of which is the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, and the mass deportation of the Jews from their homeland. The kingdom of the fist doesn't work. It seeks the highest good of retribution, forgetting that God is the God of all people. And so if he must seek retribution against our enemies, he must also seek retribution against us. And we'd all be destroyed. But God is love, and so that's not an acceptable outcome for him. And so the kingdom of God isn't the fist-shaped kingdom. The kingdom of God is the cross-shaped kingdom. The kingdom of God doesn't come through the use of violence to achieve retribution. Rather, it is an unswerving commitment to love that leads to reconciliation. That love is other-oriented, self-giving love. There's something about this kind of love that calls out to us. Scripture says that we are made in God's image. Theologians tell us that that image is twisted and distorted by sin and selfishness. I believe, though, that since we were designed to live in intimate fellowship with God, whose life is characterized by this kind of love, that that kind of love calls out to the image of God inside each of us. That image, being twisted and distorted, still reverberates with this kind of love when we encounter it. By showing such love in the face of depravity. After all, he forgave those who were in the process of killing him while they were doing it, God perfectly shows his love. When we see that, when we encounter that love, when we understand that love, it calls out to us, my child, come home. God wants to be reconciled to us. But what does that mean for how we ought to live? Well, Jesus says that his people should reflect the character of their God. Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them do, to do to you. Love your enemies. Do good to them. 
lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your Father is compassionate. In other words, when the world sees God's people, the world should see a reflection of God. And if we reflect God, then we must desire reconciliation rather than retribution with others. How do we do this? We do this through the way of the cross. Like the Israelites, you see the Romans as the source of all evil in the world, it's easy for us to look outside of ourselves and see the evil and think that that's the reason why the world is as messed up as it is. And so we see Putin in Ukraine, for example. And yes, it's right for us to pray that God would end that situation, that God would bring reconciliation into that situation. But sometimes when we get so focused on the evil outside of ourselves, we forget about the evil that we can address, the evil inside of us. We are sinners saved by grace. That grace doesn't merely excuse the sin that we've done. God's grace isn't meant to simply pretend like things didn't happen. Rather, it is meant to shape us into new kinds of people. It does that by calling us to be like Jesus, whose life is peculiar in that he loves his enemies. And so to be God's people, to embrace the way of the cross-shaped kingdom, we must learn to love our enemies. How do we do that? I mean, that can seem rather abstract, right? Well, I think that how we love our enemies is going to depend on who we are, because we all have different enemies, and we all have different opportunities to love them, but I think there's a common starting point, and that is prayer. If you want to embrace the way of the cross-shaped kingdom, we begin by praying for our enemies. Not a general prayer like, oh God, please be nice to my enemies, but a specific prayer. A prayer that begins by naming our enemies. We all have enemies. They're the people we don't like. Some of those people are people that you know we've met and who treat us badly. Some of our enemies are people we've never met before, but they are people who stand for things that we don't like. We also have enemies who don't like us. Maybe some of them have a reason not to like us. Maybe some of them don't. But when we're aware of people we don't like, or people we, or who don't like us, we can pray for them. Specifically, we can pray that God would give them the same grace and patience on the day of judgment, that we would hope that he would extend to us. After all, as Jesus says, you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. In other words, if we are God's people, we should call out for reconciliation. If we're the kind of people who are quick to call out for God's wrath, our own standard of judgment condemns us. But if we are merciful and gracious to others, that we can expect mercy and grace from God. Now, praying for your enemies feels unnatural. It takes work and deliberate effort. It's a discipline. But you may find that God transforms your heart towards those enemies when you pray for them. Personally, I've found that when I've prayed for my enemies, God transforms my enmity into compassion. I'm able to look beyond the, the behaviors that alienate me from that person and look instead to the hurt behind those behaviors. And so suddenly I can feel a deep compassion for the person. Oh Lord, this person who's treating me so badly must be in so much pain. Lord, help them to find rest from that pain. Help them to know how much you love them. Help them to know that you can, can heal their lives and that they don't need to live like this. 
And when God fills our hearts with compassion for our enemies, then we act out of that compassion, and that's what loving our enemies look like. And that's what receiving God's kingdom looks like. Jesus was rejected by many of his contemporaries because his kingdom didn't look like the kingdom the people wanted. So when Jesus comes to us, do we accept him and his cross-shaped kingdom, or do we reject him, ignore him, or pretend that he is someone more in line with our preferences? To accept the cross-shaped kingdom means to accept the claims that it makes on our lives. You can know that you are not going to dominate your enemies in the kingdom of God, but you're going to offer yourself on behalf of them because that's how evil is overcome, with the kind of love that turns enemies into friends. That's the way that God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And so if you long for a world in which God's will is done, where evil is set aside and God's peace reigns, then when God comes to you, you must accept that your king is Jesus, the crucified one.